Romans, uh, in Romans 10, we continue the study of faith and works because, uh, well, we've been looking at it for some time and not really just to cover Romans, but to cover the misunderstandings of Romans that um, are always, it seems, at war with a proper understanding of faith and works. So we wanted to get a proper understanding of Romans in order to combat that misunderstanding. And uh, that's why we're here. So we had stopped last time about midway through 10 at verse 16, because we said it actually goes with the next chapter, and it's true. This is introducing a different idea, which is the idea of Israel's disobedience into Romans 11. The disobedience of the people of Israel, if you will, gave opportunity for the rest of the nations to obey. And that's what the focus of this section of Romans is, second half of 10 into the 11th chapter. But first, it has to establish that Israel disobeyed um, and did not believe and, and were in some sense uh, rejected, but not so as to be thrown away or to be tossed. Uh, they were, they're still the people, um, you know, when Romans is written, as Paul would say, he himself is an Israelite and uh, will follow from there. But it's the same as we have talked about before, insofar as the letter and the things that it's talking about are between Jew and Gentile. And so the contrast of works, as it were, and grace or faith is a contrast between the law of Moses and the law of Christ. It's not, as so many falsely teach, <laughs> um, a contrast between obedience and salvation by faith alone. That does not exist in Scripture. Nothing in the Bible ever makes it okay to disobey God or says that you're not called to obey or that you don't have to fulfill his commandments. That's not in the Bible anywhere. Misunderstanding Romans might lead you to that, but we're trying to show very plainly from every chapter how that the whole book is not about that. It's not about obedience. A uh, question of obedience to God or whether we obey him or not, that's not a question ever in the Bible. The question is Jew or Gentile. Do we have to be Jewish? What's the value of Israel then? These are the things that Romans is covering. So the 16th verse of Romans 10, they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us, that is, who has believed our report. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. But I ask, haven't they heard? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, um, oh, wait a minute, what did I do? Oh, yes, in the 19th. But I asked, did Israel not understand? First Moses said, I'll make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I'll make you angry. Then Isaiah, so bold as to say, I've been found by those who did not seek me. I've shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. I ask then, 11, uh, 1 continues, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Right. There's not a rejection of the people. We're saying they did not listen for a time. And this opens the door for the Gentiles to come in. Which is the seventh verse of chapter 11. We're just going to make this point first in outline format. He, uh, Romans 11, 7 through 8. What then? Israel... Uh, failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, 
eyes that would not see, ears that would not hear, down to this very day. Then you have the 11th verse of chapter 11. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, 12th verse continues, uh, their trespass... Uh, yeah, this is not right. Rather, their trespass... Through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. If their trespass means riches for the world and their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Right, so it's fairly clear, isn't it? We started in 16 saying, but they didn't all listen. And they had eyes but could not see, ears but could not hear. And then we asked, well, did God reject the people? And he said, no, no, they're not rejected. He foreknew this people. They're not rejected because of that. Did they stumble, Romans 11, 11, in order that they might fall? Well, by no means. Through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. How much more will their full inclusion be? And that's the a, a point that's echoed in the 15th verse. If their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? True. If they rejected for a time, and this opened the door, and the world is saved, life from the dead is the right answer for what happens if they accept it. <laughs> what if they embrace this? Because if you think about this, it makes very good sense that those who grew up knowing God, being taught about God in the Bible, would be good Christians. They would be good teachers. They would be able to help establish and strengthen and be dedicated to this thing that has always been what their whole country was about. So that is the idea, and it should be that way. If that reconciliation opened the door and made, uh, or I'm sorry, if that rejection opened the door and made reconciliation possible, the acceptance would have to mean something like life from the dead. And in the end of this, you find at the 30th verse of Romans 11, just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, that is to say the Jews, so the Jews too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also now may receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. So he's not saying here that you have no choice but to disobey, that you're born sinful and you can only do sinful things. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying Israel rejected so that the nations could repent and get mercy. And now, you know, their disobedience to the gospel when it first comes out is so that God can show mercy to them too, so that everybody comes in on the ground level. We all need to be forgiven. We all have mercy from God, salvation by grace, forgiveness when we become Christians. That's what he's saying. Not that you can't obey or that you're required to disobey. He's saying no, he's done this so that they're on equal footing. Jew and Gentile are on equal footing before God. Right? That's the big picture of Romans 11 and the point that's being made. So it starts again in more detail with the disobedience of Romans 10, 16. They've not obey, all obeyed the gospel. Um, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? This is coming from uh, the prophet Isaiah in chapter 52 and 53 that I'd like to look at with you. Um, Isaiah 52, we pick up the 7th verse and the 10th verse, um, and then uh, 13 through the end of that. Just to understand, remember 
Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. This is the thing that he was talking about earlier in Romans 10. How beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah continues, Lord, who has believed what he heard from us. That's coming up in 53.1. But first he said, how beautiful are the feet. Then the 10th verse, the Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. All the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. So his arm is bared, meaning his strength is showing. And that's why in 53, verse 1, it says, Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Though that is the force of Romans 10, 16, saying they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah said, who has believed what he heard from us? True, the rejection of Jesus is what we're talking about. So yeah, when it said how beautiful are the feet of the one who brings good news. Remember, good news is God's spell uh, when it enters English language and then becomes gospel. And this is the gospel that has been preached from that time, if you will. And so obedience to the gospel is what he's talking about, which has not happened in the first century for many some did, Paul did, and of course those at Rome who were receiving this letter did, but the majority did not. So back in Romans 10, at 17 uh, and 18, it said, as noted before, so faith then comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. That's what we mean by that. Now, it's true that the word of God generates faith and makes Christians. That is true. But precisely what we mean in this context is the belief of God, the, the true belief, comes from the word of Christ. Those who obeyed the gospel in the first century were the true believers. The others might claim that they have life in the scriptures, but they don't actually accept the testimony of the scriptures because if they did, they would obey the gospel too. Then the 18th verse of Romans 10, I ask, haven't they heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone to all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. And I do want to look at that. That's Psalm 19. Um, I think that's worth looking at, but it's Psalm 19. Uh, verses 1 through 4, just the opening of that song. And the point that's being made, I think, should be emphasized. Have they heard? Because a lot of people wonder who has heard. There's oftentimes questions about who has heard the gospel? Have they had a chance to hear it? What about these people? Or what about this civilization or this society or whatever it might be? Well, the answer is Psalm 19, 1 to 4. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor their words. Their voice is not heard. And yet their voice goes out throughout the earth. And their words to the end of the world. This is to say... You have the testimony of nature. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. The sky above his handiwork. The cycle day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. 
the, the cycle, the repetition, the, the order of nature is telling you something. Though there is no speech, there are no words, there's no voice that is heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. Not literal words, not literal speech. It's reason. It's your thought. You, you can see these patterns. You can understand that, yeah, there is a God who has put order to this. This is a real thing. That's all he's getting at. Have they heard? Yes. And what I like about this reference um, is that it's universal. This is not particularly Jewish, nor is it Christian in and of itself. You know, it's, it's from the Psalms, but it's not a particularly Israelite thing to understand. Everybody can see how glorious the heavens are. Everybody can see how God has put order up there in the skies and how day, you know, days and nights certain and, and cycles, seasons and years. Everybody on earth who, you know, reaches an age of reason <laughs> is able to use that reason to see these patterns and these things happening and to draw some conclusions about God. That's what I like about this is that it's true of human existence. It doesn't require any knowledge of scripture. It doesn't require any exposure to any specific culture or teacher. It's just the way that we are made and the circumstances that we are in. You can see it. And you should. So then we go back into Romans 10. Because if that's good enough for you and me, that's good enough for them too, you understand? I think too often we have a standard for those who are outside the church and a different standard for those who are inside the church, but that's not so with God. It's the same standard for everybody. Everybody has the same chance here. Romans 10, 19, didn't Israel understand? Moses says, I'll make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. This is from Deuteronomy 32, and I think this also is worth looking at in a bit more detail, if you will. In Deuteronomy 32, there's a lot of things happening, but this is the passage. Actually, uh, right after what we're reading here is where we go on to the root of bitterness. The person who has a public affirmation that, yes, this law is good, and yes, I believe in it, but privately disagrees. That's a serious problem. But it starts here in Deuteronomy 32. And uh, one of the things that Moses says, these are the words of a song. <laughs> but among the things that he says, three, I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. Then, four, five, six, the rock, his work is perfect. All his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children, because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, foolish and senseless people? Isn't he your father who created you, who made you and established you? That's the song of Moses. And it continues here in the 15th verse. But Jeshurun grew fat. Jeshurun is a spiritual name for the people. Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, stout, and sleek. Then he forsook God who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. They stirred him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they'd never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never feared or dreaded. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord saw it and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I'll see what their end will be for they're a perverse generation, children in whom there is no faithfulness. They've made me jealous with what is no God. They provoke me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are no people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. 
that's the context. <laughs> that they had been saved, they had been brought out, and yet they got comfortable. They grew fat, it says. Fat, stout, and sleek. Talk about livestock. They got fat and sassy, comfortable. And, he, and they forsook him and scoffed at the rock. Stirred him to jealousy with strange gods. And he said, I will stir you to jealousy with strange nations. So this is the fulfillment. Romans tells us, Paul tells us in Romans 10, 19. First of all, Moses said, I'll make you jealous of those who are not a nation. When he said, did Israel not understand? Yes, they understood. From the time of Moses, this had been said. From the very beginning, before they even got into the promised land, God was already saying this. And then, Romans 10 continues, 20 to 21, Isaiah is so bold as to say, I've been found by those who did not seek me. I've shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, all day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and a contrary people. This is Isaiah 64, and likewise, I think it's worth looking at it in detail. Understand the point. See, when Paul quotes something, it's not a proof text. You see, he's not just picking words that sound like they're making the point that he wants to make. <laughs> he's pulling a reference that points you to a specific event, a specific point in the narrative or in the prophecy that applies entirely to what he's saying. So Isaiah 64 starts this way. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. So this is a request to God to come and to work his mighty wonders as he had done in Egypt against his adversaries, the nations. And then in the ninth verse of Isaiah 64, they said, Do not be so terribly angry, O Lord. Do not remember iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we all are your people. Your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house, where our fathers praised you, has been burned by fire. All our pleasant places have become ruins. Will you restrain yourself at these things, Lord? Will you keep silent and afflict us so terribly? That's the request. The response is Isaiah 65. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. Remember, they said, we wanted to see signs that nobody had seen, that we did not ask for. But he said, no, I'm ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. That's Israel. That's why Paul said what he did. I've been found by those who didn't seek me, Romans 10, 20. And in 21, but of Israel, all day long I've held up my hands to a disobedient, contrary people. This is the, the passage. The place lies in ruins. They want God to come down and take vengeance on Assyria and or um, Babylon, depending on how you look at this, wherever you want to apply it, it's fine. But point being, he wants them, or they want God to come and take vengeance on the foreign enemies. And God said, I'm ready to be found by them. All day long, I spread out my hands to a rebellious people. They walk in a way not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens, making offerings on bricks, sitting on tomb or inside tombs and spending the night in secret places, eating pig's flesh and broth of tainted meat in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, 
Don't come near to me because I'm too holy for you. These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day. Behold, it's written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their lap both your iniquities and your father's iniquities together because they made offerings on the mountains and insulted me on the hills. I will measure into their lap payment for their former deeds. So this is not a very friendly passage. <laughs> uh, the condemnation is pretty harsh, although it's true. There was a great rejection of God. We, we did not listen as we should have, did not respond the way that we should have. And he said, as a result of this, he's ready to be found by those who didn't seek him. This is the door opening to the Gentiles. All right. There really is one more thing here. So let's do that. Romans 11, uh, 7 through 8 said, again, what uh, Israel was seeking, it failed to obtain. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it had been written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, ears that would not hear down to this very day. And I think we should talk about eyes that do not see and ears that do not hear for a moment here. This started as well in Deuteronomy. It's chapter 29, verses 2 through 6. If you wish to go there and join me. But this also is a concept that comes down to us from Moses, from the beginning, from the time in the wilderness. It has been around the whole time. It is an old saw. It's an old saying. Deuteronomy 29, 2 through 6. Moses summoned Israel and said, you have seen all the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and his servants in his land. The great trials your eyes saw, the signs, those great wonders. But to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. I have led you 40, day, or 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you. Your sandals have not worn off your feet. You have not eaten bread. You have not drunk wine or strong drink that you may know that I am the Lord your God. When you came to this place, Sihon, king of Heshbon, Og, king of Bashan, came out against us to battle, but we defeated them. <laughs> Why is he saying this? Well, as he said, to this day, you still haven't got a heart to understand, eyes to see, ears to hear. Forty years in the wilderness, and your clothes have not worn out, and your sandals have not worn off? What's the meaning of that, pray tell? How do you think that is? Why did that happen? This is what he means. Where's the understanding? Where's the sight? Well, Isaiah used it in the start of his uh, teachings. If you go to Isaiah 6, it happens early. Probably you remember, if you're a Bible student, the famous quotation from Isaiah. But did you remember that it started in Isaiah 6, 9? The Lord said to me, go, say to this people, keep on hearing, but don't understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make their heart, the heart of this people dull, their ears heavy, blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And I said, how long, Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste, without inhabitant, houses without people, the land a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away. The holy seed is the end, the 13th verse. The holy seed is its stump. And we're going to prune everything that is not the righteous, getting it all the way down to the righteous. That's what he says. The eyes to see, ears to hear is about pruning away those that are not spiritual minded, that are not willing to hear and understand the Bible, 
those people are, are not going to make it. And I don't want to see anybody in that situation, but this is the way that it is. And then you get to Isaiah 29, which uh, Romans is quoting. It's Isaiah 29, and we'll get 9 to 14 of that. Astonish yourselves and be astonished. Blind yourselves and be blind. Be drunk, but not with wine. Stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured upon you a spirit of deep sleep and has covered your eyes, the prophets, and covered your ears or your heads, the seers. And the vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I can't read it because it's sealed. And when they give it, the book to one who cannot read saying read this he says i cannot read <laughs> and the lord said because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far away from me their fear of me is a commandment taught by men therefore behold i will again do wonderful things with this people with wonder upon wonder and the wisdom of their wise men will perish the discernment of their discerning men will be hidden this happened in the new testament Jesus Christ the righteous did wonder upon wonder, and it culminated with the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave, from the dead. We are seeing and reading the testimony of those who knew that and saw it. When we read Romans 11, 7 through 8, Paul is telling us, yes, that what they were trying to do, they failed to get. They were hardened because God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, ears that would not hear, because he was winnowing, or, uh, well, I guess winnowing, but because he was narrowing this down to just the righteous. And it's still that way in the New Testament, and Jesus talks about whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Many times. So, we'll stop there for now. In Romans 11, we have a lot more to cover, of course, but for now, this is the first point, which is the disobedience of Israel. Israel's disobedience means life for the nations. Their rejection of these things open the door for salvation to come to all. The faith that we have comes from the word of Christ, and yet, the existence of God is testified by the heavens and the earth and the cycles and seasons. So there is not an excuse for not knowing these things. And some of those who rejected God were hardened. True. If we refuse to accept his word, if we refuse to accept the teaching of God, then yes, there does come a time when we are hardened and we're not hearing it, we're not seeing it, and we're not going to. And we just hope and pray that a time comes when that can stop, when you can get freed and come back to your senses. But all of this is to say that God has constrained everybody under disobedience. Everybody who becomes a Christian is doing so through God's grace and through forgiveness. Those who didn't know God, those who walked in the ways of their fathers, however it was, which is many of us, we have obtained mercy from God for our straying and, and our things that we did that, that uh, you know we should not have been doing. But then there are those uh, among you uh, and among us who were brought up by the people of God, who were brought up by people who believed in God, and but you also have had things that you needed to be forgiven of too. We're all of us together in the church by the grace of God and by the forgiveness of God. We are all of us de dependent upon him and dependent upon his mercy. And in this way, God has made us equals. Uh, one thing's not better than the other. They're both useful. They're both needed. They strengthen each other. 
They build each other. Iron sharpens iron. Today, are you a Christian, a child of God? Well, it's time to become a Christian if you haven't done so. You realize that you are lost, that your sins have separated you from God. You need to be saved. You need to be rescued from the condemnation that is um, appropriate for that kind of action. God has prepared the way by providing a sacrifice in the blood of his son, Jesus. You obtain that blood and the forgiveness, the, the washing away of sins that that blood accomplishes by obeying him in repentance and in obedience to baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We stand ready to help you with um, finding the water and being baptized in his name to become a child of God, to be saved. If today as a Christian you have not lived right before God, we are ready to help you with our prayers because everybody needs prayers now and again. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing.